Thank you. So, um, first thing, uh, thank you for uh, being there uh, this morning because <laughs> it's not a, it's a really uh, late uh, talk. But so, thank you for those uh, being in the in the room here. Uh, we'll talk about uh, Metabrick platform, uh, which basically is used to quickly develop the tools you you want. And my goal is to to make you think it's really cool and you will want to use it. So who am I? Uh, I'm known under the handle Gomor. Um, I'm an information security engineer for 15 years now and a Perl developer for uh, the same uh, amount of time. Uh, I said the word, it's Perl, not Python. Um, I'm a CPAN author uh, for various Perl modules. In 15 years, I did some uh, some modules, uh, of course. Uh, Netpacket, maybe some people uh, used it in the past. It, uh, it's a module to easily craft network packets to inject them on the network and get responses. It's a f sort of scappy uh, in Perl. Um, but it was quite complex to use, so I uh, rewrote it uh, to, to make it even simpler and more modular, uh, and it's now the NetFrame suit. Uh, there is also the NetWrite uh, module. Uh, which is used to send packets at various layers, uh, if you want to inject packets at layer 2, at layer 3, or at layer 4 on the network. But that's not the, the subject of today, so I will skip on that. I presented also already in the past uh, CNFP3, which is an OS operating, uh, an, an operating system fingerprinting suite. Um, uh, yes, it was back in 2012. Uh, but today it's about Metabrick. So what is Metabrick, apart the subject of today? Um, it's not a Pokemon, even though uh, there is a Pokemon card, at least uh, in French. <laughs> Finally, I found it after uh, I decided the name of the tool. Um, but it's a, it's a platform and, uh, and much more. Um, I merged uh, three, uh, three features in, uh, in Metabrick. The first one is to have a Unix-like shell, and uh, so you can use on a, a shell replacement on your uh, daily uh, stuff. Um, a true language with a readable uh, print loop. Um, Python uh, developers are used to, to, to such uh, a readable print loop, but not in Perl community, so that's why I, uh, I wanted to do that also. And of course, many bricks, uh, which uh, helps you finally to quickly develop or prototype some new tools. Um, because in my experience, there is a, you you need something quick and now, so you have to to have the good tools to do it. Uh, so a true language, I said it. I said the, the word. It's written in Perl. Uh, there are many reasons to use Perl. Well, for me, the primary is that this is the language I master, so I'm using Perl. And yes, the picture is, yeah, it should give you the, the will to use Perl. Um, why did I develop Metabrick? Um, I'm a, a CLI lover. I, I want to be able to do everything from the command line. So I want to be able to automate all the things from the command line. And um, I also started to, to apply the do-it-once principle because I was tired of always writing some throwaway script to do something, and the next time I wanted to do the same stuff, I didn't find the, the script I wrote earlier. So, well, I was tired of doing again and again the same stuff, so uh, I just developed Metabrick also for that. Um, Regarding Unix shells, uh, I found the pipe uh, too limited for uh, my needs, and uh, that's why I, uh, I thought uh, about a new mechanism to, to uh, make bricks. Uh, we will see that in a few slides. And uh, for that, I needed a powerful language. Perl is, uh, is a powerful language, so it was okay. Um, it allows you to rapidly develop a new tool directly from the command line. You write a Perl code directly on the command line and you have the results. And uh, you can finally write scripts 
Uh, so you don't have to, to type again and again the same commands in the shell. And uh, I wanted a normalized syntax because I don't know if you are like me, but um, every tool has its own usage rules, its own flags, uh, sometimes quite uh, cryptic. And uh, I wanted something um, you easily uh, readable by human. Um, there is another tool uh, which came up a little bit before uh, Metabrick, which is called Rebus. It has been presented at a uh, French security conference uh, in the past. And the goal uh, was uh, exactly the same, normalize tool usage. But for Rebus, uh, the goal was to automate interaction between tools. And uh, in Metabrick, I didn't want to automate the interaction between tools because I want to, to let the human decide on what he wants to do. Um, and Rebus is not a shell. And again, its usage is not so easy, so we are with some uh, crypti cryptic uh, arguments to pass, and you have to, to really understand how it works to use it. Um, but basically, both are wrappers around existing tools. Uh, and uh, Metabrick is not only wrapper about existing tools, there is some um, own development within Metabrick. And each time, uh, I write a brick. I try to use the best CPAN modules because for uh, those um, familiar with CPAN, you may have multiple modules doing the same thing. So you have to test which one is the best. And uh, so I did it uh, each time I, I write a brick so I don't have to, to check again which is the best uh, CPAN module. Uh, time for the first demo. Uh, I will show you how to use uh, the shell with the three kinds of command lines. Um, you can, like any uh, Unix shell, you can call uh, any external binary program. Uh, you can call specific bricks commands. This is where you have some uh, specific Metabrick stuff. And of course, it's uh, a Perl uh, interpreter, so you can directly uh, type some uh, Perl uh, code. And using uh, the bricks is as easy as knowing five commands, use, set, get, run, and help. Uh, use to load the brick, set to set some property uh, on the brick, get to uh, to have information on, on values for properties, and run to execute a command and help, of course, to have some help. So, first demo. I uh, recorded the videos because I'm always, f uh, I always forgive what I want to do when uh, I do it live. So, um, first thing, you launch uh, the Metabrick shell. Uh, it loads a bunch of bricks. And this is uh, the bricks I'm using for uh, for my work. Uh, here you see it's a Perl interpreter, so you just type some stuff, and uh, here it does uh, basic math. Um, you can define some variables, uh, a Perl array here, and uh, it outputs. You can see the content of a variable easily by just naming it. You can do it for hashes also. Uh, you dump the content easily, so you can explore a structure. Uh, now, I want to use a Perl module to, to do some stuff. I want to check my network interface, for instance. So I load the module, I instantiate the object here. It dumps the content of the object. You can call methods on it. Well, that's uh, basically a Perl uh, interpreter. And finally, you can use, yes, that's a shell, so you can uh, change to any di directory, uh, list what you have. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the output of ls command is uh, translated to a Perl uh, array directly, because in fact, ls here is an alias, and it's an alias for the shell command brick, capture method, or capture command. So if I run that, it's exactly the same. Well, that's an alias. And the output of a run command is automatically saved in the dollar $run variable uh, at, the, at the end of the screen. And uh, so it's a Perl array, so you can just call, uh, if you want to get the last file of the array, you, you just call it. Uh, if you want to count how many files you have, uh, well, it's just a matter of a Perl command. Uh, yes, 
So if you want to see what you can do with shell command, this is the, the, the brick to call external commands. So every external command goes through this brick uh, under the wood. And um, yes, now I want to use automa to automatically use sudo for uh, my next commands. So I set the attribute use sudo to true. Uh, here you can see when you call the set command, the dollar set variable is automatically set to the value. It can be handy sometimes. Uh, get is the same. It's automatically set uh, to the value of the attribute. So now I call ls again, and it automatically calls uh, sudo. And uh, the output is saved in your, in your user session. So you don't have root privileges anymore here. And you can play with the output of the command. So that's really handy. OK. So that was for the shell. Uh, features, most notable ones. Um, you have the built-ins, CD, alias. You can customize the shell with a .metabrick RC file. You have history on link. Uh, it's, it's like a Unix shell. Um, you have meta exploit like syntax, you have seen it. And completion for uh, commands, for files, for variables, for brick names. You have completion everywhere, so you, you, tip the, you, you have to type the minimum uh, of characters to, to use it. And uh, because it is using the GNU uh, lib read line, you have all the control keys, you have control R to, to search for your history. What is a brick? So I said it. Uh, it's wrappers around external programs, but not only. But a brick is uh, an object and is defined by a set of properties like tags, category, or, or attributes. And uh, because it's object oriented, a brick may inherit some property from uh, another one. So it's easy to write a new brick which looks like an existing one. For instance, the file PSV brick. Um, is able to handle uh, pipe separated uh, values and it just inherits from the file CSV. You just change the separator instead of a comma, it's a pipe. You can add features to existing tools because in my, in, in my experience, uh, the tool I'm using always likes some feature and it may not be easy sometimes to add the feature. So you can, by external growth, add some features. For instance, in Scalpel, um, I will speak later if I have time uh, regarding Scalpel. Uh, in the end, the brick is a reusable per module you can use from the command line interface or from a classical uh, interface, I mean in, your, in any Perl program. The brick tool is something uh, which helps use Metabrick because a brick depends on external programs or Perl modules. And brick tool make that really easy for you to use. You just call the run brick install command on the brick you want to use, and it will install all the dependencies for a CV search. It will even um, fetch the GitHub repository, uh, copy files where it needs. Well, everything is done under the hood for you. You don't have to care about that. Then you, you use the brick and tip help, and uh, it says what you can do with it. The Metabrick itself uh, is updated really on a daily basis, and you have a brick tool update command, so you can be always up to date on it. There are some special variables. Uh, we have seen some of them, so I will skip this slide now. Uh, the demo tool I will show you if I have time at the end, because time is running. Metabrick is composed of two main components. The Metabrick core and uh, the Metabrick repository. The Metabrick core is made uh, on a base class, the Metabrick base class, and four bricks: core global, core shell, core log, and core context. In fact, every command you type goes through the core log module, so you can trust every action you do in Metabrick, and uh, you can replace the core log module by your own one if you want. Uh, core context is where everything is kept in memory. For instance, the variables you have defined in your shell. Well, uh, I don't suggest you to look at the code for core context because it's some per magic and uh, your eyes may bleed. Uh, the Metabrick core has minimal system and per modules dependencies to make it easy to install. And Metabrick repository, where is most of the interesting bricks, of course, uh, is a separate module to install. 
with nearly no dependencies at all because dependencies are uh, handled with uh, Brick tool as uh, I've shown you uh, just before. It's more than 200 bricks and uh, I regularly uh, create new bricks. So with so much bricks, you may uh, say, but how do I find the brick I want to use for, uh, for my work? That's why bricks are tagged and you can use a brick search brick to, to search what you want to do. For instance, if I run brick search tag video, uh, it ends up with some bricks related to video. And the demo I, uh, the demo I uh, recorded was uh, recorded thanks to a brick, so I don't have to remember how to record my, uh, my desktop again. A brick tool can also help you to create a new brick. You just call the create brick command and you have a skeleton of a new brick. So that's really handy. And the create tool to create a skeleton of a new per script. If I don't have screen anymore. <laughs> okay, at least one. Um, here you can see at the top uh, from the shell you use a brick and you call a command. Here it just uh, do a JYP location for an IP address. If you want to do it in a per program, thanks to the create tool, uh, it will uh, just create the skeleton here to, uh, to load the core context module. Uh, and after that, you have to use uh, the module and uh, do your stuff. So demo three. Um, here, um, I want to be able to analyze the malware, but I am not a reverse engineer. And I just want to, to take a screenshot of a virtual machine before uh, the execution of the malware and after and perform a diff on what happened. Uh, so for that, I have to use multiple bricks. One is a system virtual box, so I can automate uh, interaction with uh, virtual box. And uh, some others are remote WinXE and WMI to, to execute commands remotely on Windows machine or to fetch some uh, attributes. And in the end, I want also to use volatility to perform different uh, memory. So. Okay. So first thing to do, I want to, to, look, uh, to, to start my virtual machine. So I call the list command. As you can see, everything uh, in uh, Metabrick uh, is outputted as a per variable, so you can use it uh, like, uh, like a per variable. I want to start the Windows 7 machine. I gather its ID. Uh, I verify it is started. Yes, it's already started. But just to check, I will start it again. But, uh, well, okay, it says uh, it's already started, so no problem. So I will execute uh, a command to test uh, it works. Here is CMDXE, so it gives me a shell to the Windows machine. Perfect, it works. Uh, in this example, I will, uh, I will execute uh, calc.exe as, as a malware. Huh? It's uh, just a proof of concept here. So get win from the process is a WML stuff. So I'm searching everything if it's uh, larger than the screen. The screen is uh, outputted to less, so you can search search for the result. That's a cool feature. So now I execute calc.exe. Okay. And I search again. And it failed. Yeah. Because I didn't call the, the good method, I have to execute it in background. Because I, I did uh, abort the stuff by a uh, using control C, so execute in background the calc.exe. Now I check again the process list, and okay, so I have the, the malware has been executed. But I want to do the, the same with uh, volatility. So in VirtualBox, you can dub the, the content of the memory. Here, as you can see, I, I didn't remember how to use it, so I just uh, use the command without an argument, and it saves me, uh, uh, it gives me some, uh, some help on how to use uh, the brick. So I dump the VM memory. So in a virtual box, it's uh, an ELF file which is outputted and you have to extract just the memory part from the ELF file. So there is uh, another command to just extract uh, that information. And now we have um, a file uh, 
volatility can read. And you call the PS list command for the brick volatility on the dollar run because it has been saved in the last command. And uh, you should have, if you search for calc.exe, okay, so you have it. So you can see it's again a, a, a Perl variable which is outputted here. So, but that's great. Now I used some bricks to do some separate small jobs, but uh, this is something I want to automate. And I can simply write a new, a new brick which will uh, do all of that for me. And that's uh, really one of the of the goal behind Metabrick is that the more brick you write, uh, the more easy you will be able to write new bri new bricks and do uh, new stuff. So. So uh, I call it the new brick uh, remote diff. In fact, uh, we made aware yesterday that there is a tool called uh, volatility diff, which just uh, do the same kind of stuff, but I was not aware uh, of it. So how to use it? You call help on the, on the brick. So you can see you have a bunch of uh, commands available here. You can restart a VM remotely, take a snapshot, upload a file, perform a netstat diff or a process diff before and after execution of uh, a program. Uh, you have a set of properties to define uh, your username and password to connect to the remote host. Uh, everything has been set, so you will not see in the demo how it, uh, how it you just call set on the attribute and set the value, which is not complicated. So first thing, I want the VM to be uh, in uh, in a good uh, state, so I restart the VM first. I ping it, I'm waiting. In fact, you will not see the VM because it is started in headless mode, because really I want to do everything on the command line. I don't want to see uh, Windows uh, at all. So now I go to the, the my tools directory. Up, up. Okay, the VM pings, that's great, okay. So I will execute, I will first upload netcat. Here the malware is just netcat. I will upload netcat to the target. Okay, great. Uh, it's calling SMB client uh, under the hood. Uh, now netcat is uploaded. I take a snapshot of the VM before execution of the malware. So it's dumping the VM uh, core, extracting the main dump. Okay. So I save the file name for a later use because you want a diff, so we'll have to use that again. Now I execute the malware. This command is not uh, simple enough. I have to, to simplify it. But by default, the file is uploaded to the C Windows 10 directory, so I call it here. I will just do a connection to, to my website. Okay, this time it's uh, calling the execute in background command, so there is no problem. I take the snapshot after executing the malware. So again, dumping the VM core, extracting the memory dump. And in the end, we have the state before and after execution of the malware. So now I want to know what has changed regarding processes between these uh, two uh, uh, these two runs. So I perform process diff against before and after. So um, uh, it's calling the volatility ps list command uh, again. So what can I see? I have a few new processes. I have my uh, netcat exe, cmd exe. That's okay. There is also AVG, so I should have turned off my uh, antivirus because it is bugging me on the, on the result. But well. And Netcat uh, is probably calling conhost. I'm not very familiar with conhost exe. So I can uh, I save the output for it to use. And now I want to do a netstat diff to see if there has been some network connection. Uh, made from uh, from this malware, so that's exactly the same uh, the same stuff. Perform that step diff. So you have the 
the output here, you have three connections. Uh, one of them is again the AVG, the second one is also AVG. So it is bugging me. But anyway, you see Netcat is connected to an IP address, so yes, you, are, you have been able to see uh, the new connection from the, from the malware. So again, uh, I've saved that for uh, later use. Okay. So it was a remote wind diff. So that's great. Uh, I wrote a new tool with, uh, with existing bricks, but um, I, I'm a user and uh, there is some feature which is lacking, so I want to, to do some more stuff. For instance, I want to save the output associated with this file. That's great. There is a, there is a, a brick which exists ex exactly for that. So we would just call run file CSV write uh, dollar process diff out .csv and you have saved the output in a CSV file. You want to do a reverse lookup on the IP address. You also have a brick for that. Um, you want to use uh, the virus total API to check if this IP address is uh, malicious or not. So you use uh, virus total API, same with showdown if you want to get some information. You have more than 200 bricks, so the, uh, chances are if you want to do something, uh, there is a, a brick which at least can help you uh, do that. Some of uh, the best bricks in the API category, I'm a Splunk uh, user, so uh, I have an API to uh, interrogate Splunk. It's not complete because uh, Splunk API is quite huge. Um, you have a client Elasticsearch because I do have uh, an Elasticsearch cluster, so I want to to check the state of my shards, uh, all of that stuff, so uh, I wrote it here. MongoDB, Redis, uh, REST, if you want to interrogate an API, a uh, REST client is always useful. You want to automate SSH stuff, so you have a client uh, SSH, uh, Twitter. You, maybe you want a REST server. Uh, there is a REST server, so you, you can um, weaponize a brick by uh, calling a few commands to make a brick accessible via REST API and gives you the output as a JSON because you have some string conversion stuff and you can play with JSON or XML or whatever. You want a DNS server to, to perform a man in the middle and spoof the answer, there is a server DNS brick. Well, you have seen you have many, many bricks. In the network category too, if you want to parse the output of Nmap, you should use the network Nmap brick. The output is already, already parsed. Um, I, I talked about the CNFP3, which is uh, an OS fingerprinting tool I, I uh, developed. And uh, it was quite complicated to install, but because now there is a brick, it's just run brick tool, install a network CNFP3, and you can play with it. So it uh, makes things really simpler. Conclusion, more than 200 bricks. Every tool, in fact, becomes a Perl variable. In Unix, everything is a file. In Metabrick, everything is a Perl variable. Uh, you can automate really all the things from the command line. Uh, you can add missing features to existing tools. Um, because uh, tool usage is normalized, it helps you reuse a tool. I, I wrote some brick maybe one year ago, and uh, uh, during one year I didn't use it, and uh, I, I found it uh, again, and well, I, I could use the, the, the thing I wanted to use with no, uh, no headache. Directly, so it's really it helps reusability. It's a shell unification also. Uh, SQLit has its shell. Redis has its sh its shell. Many tools are their own shell, and here you have the, the same shell for uh, any tools. Uh, Paul, yes, who would be interested in uh, in a workshop if I did uh, do a workshop on uh, Metabrick? Yeah. Few people, okay. So uh, I don't know if I have a few minutes left. Maybe if I can do the other demo or yeah, okay. So I will go back to the scalpel stuff. Yes, scalpel. So is a forensic tool to uh, carve some files uh, from uh, from binary data. Uh, and uh, for me, it lacked two features. Uh, uh, to easily generate the, the configuration file, because the first thing to do is to generate the configuration file to say how to extract which kind of data. 
And the second one is that it extracts um, files with, without checking the MIME tip or the magic tip. So you have to, to do it after extraction to verify the file it extracted is really what you, you wanted to extract. So for this, uh, I used a, a challenge, a root me challenge. The idea is uh, some bad guy uh, kidnapped your cat and you found uh, some uh, some device uh, on the crime scene and you have to carve uh, that to, together, uh, together um, information and, and, and in the end find uh, your cat, your missing cat, and you will have to use a few, a few bricks for that. So, the demo. So, so the challenge in French is named uh, Trouver le chat, find the cat. Uh, you have two files. So, because LS uh, is captured, you, you do LS and save the files for later, later use. You will use a file type brick to check for MIME and magic types of the file. You see a uh, hash ref with, uh, so this is a gzip file. Okay, MIME type again. So, okay. I have to uncompress this file, of course, because uh, it looks like uh, really a compressed file. So you call the uncompress command. Whatever the compression method used, that's not your, your problem. The, the brick will take care of that. It will, uh, in fact, check for the MIME type and call the correct command to just uncompress the file. <coughs> okay, the file is uncompressed. I save it for it to use. Okay. Check some MIME types again. So this time we have um, uh, what looks like a file system. It's a, it's a partition, so that's a good uh, candidate for uh, file carving. You load the brick. Well, here you have uh, an error message because it's already loaded. And you want to generate a configuration file to extract some kind of files. Uh, because I know the result of the challenge, I will just generate a configuration file to extract open uh, office document. So the file is generated. Now I can call scalpel scan command to find uh, the files. OK. And here you can see you have uh, two attributes. One is unverified files, and the other one is verified files. Verified means this is truly open office document. So. So again, I know the result of the challenge, so I go di directly to the to the good file. Uh, I, I get the magic tips. It's not really useful here, but well, just for the demo, it's really an open office uh, document, open document text. Sorry. Uh, again, you have to know that you can uncompress such a kind of document. So you just call again the file compress and compress uh, command on, uh, on the file. And I, I know the result is in the JPG file, so I'm getting that. Yes, that's my cat. Uh, I know him. I've seen him. Um, uh, it's a JPEG file, so you want to uh, extract the metadata. And so you, you call get metadata uh, on it. And uh, you have some uh, GPS coordinates, so I'm just uh, uh, here. Uh, so you, you, have an, uh, you have found your cat. So it was easy. Okay. Conclusion. Um, I do have some time, so uh, it's okay. So uh, I can show you some source code. Oh, man. oh okay, perfect. So uh, I will just show you the source code of a brick. Um, I hope it's a readable Perl. You, you will say. So uh, the, the remote windif inherits from the client SMB client brick. So you can uh, upload files, download files from the remote machine. So a brick is defined with a set of properties, uh, like attributes to set username, password, uh, the volatility profile here. You can define default values for attributes, of course. Windows 7 SP1 is a good choice for uh, volatility. You have the commands. In fact, this defines the help here. You have uh, how to use uh, the arguments and the uh, required uh, modules. Here, uh, you require four uh, other bricks to, to write it. 
So upload, because you inherit from a simple client, you just have to call the upload uh, on the stuff. Uh, you have uh, argument checking in uh, each command. So you have always the same kind of error messages. So that's handy also to understand what happens. I want to execute a command, so I, um, I instantiate the remote win exit break. I set uh, his attributes and I can call it directly. So that's as easy as that. I want to restart the VM, it's the same stuff. You see, it's, it's started in headless mode. Uh, you take a snapshot uh, on the VM, so you instantiate the system virtual box again, you call the dumb core. Uh, error handling is also done in the same way for every command. And so when you use it, you just call the command and do all return and uh, you will have error messages and uh, execution will stop if there is an error. So you don't have to, to take care of error handling by, uh, by yourself when you are using some uh, existing bricks. So the process diff, okay, you, can, you, you call PS list on the first snapshot and PS list on the second one and you perform a, a diff on the two uh, per structure, it's, uh, it's really easy. Okay, let's start, same stuff. That's okay. That's, um, the code is available on the track uh, Metabrick. You have some help on how to uh, install it. Uh, it's quite easy and you even have a Docker image uh, for those who, who don't want to bother with uh, reading how to install the tool. You do, do a Docker pull Metabrick Metabrick and you have the, the stuff installed on your computer. Questions? I have been crystal clear. Hmm. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you.